Well, hello fellow Rainmakers and welcome to this briefing with Mark Stonham. And uh, the topic for this session is onboarding customers or clients. So uh, part of the end-to-end -end sequence, um, this is the sort of uh, one following the last week, which was the end of the sequence, which was keeping in touch with clients once they are no longer clients, as it were, or lost bids, and working back up through that, uh, through that sequence. Particularly important around onboarding clients, uh, a number of um, topics I'd like to cover here. And just uh, in terms of setting expectations, uh, I'm putting up suggestions of things to think about, a, a checklist. Are you thinking about? I'm not suggesting that this is a right way of doing it. So uh, um, that'll come back through the uh, through the topic. But really, it's um, giving you some some. We, we all get into a routine or a rhythm of doing various things, and sometimes it's useful to just stop and and say, well, are we doing the right thing? Is it producing the right results? Um, can we get? Can we do it better? So, if you can use this as an opportunity to think, well, how do we onboard clients? Um, that I think would be would be helpful. And particularly if you then think back, okay, for the last maybe four or five clients, which which of those projects, which of those agreements have gone well, and, and, and are there any attributable reasons why that is, and have any of them gone a bit pear-shaped? Have they had difficulties? And what could have been done to avoid those difficulties with some anticipation? And I think particularly that's the, the sort of the watchword I have for this is if you can anticipate things and put things in place yourself with your organization to make projects run smoothly client relationships run smoothly and also have the, those conversations with with clients to set those expectations and to find out particularly what they're looking for so i'll particularly highlight um five areas going through um the first of which is to say that or to suggest that size matters um there's some principles that apply, I think, for projects of any size, but the complexity increases as the size increases. So to give an example there, if, um, if there's one person on the supplier side, an independent uh, business owner or consultant, and there's one person on the, on the recipient side, then it's a relatively straightforward conversation, expectations, and so on. As the project or the client relationship gets bigger, there may be more people from the supplier uh, side, more likely, more than likely, the more people on the uh, on the client side, and particularly look there um, at some of those handover aspects. If there is one person or a team involved with the sales cycle, the, the relationship development to the point of contract, and then there's a handover to a delivery team, and this might be that there is a business development team, and then the handover to a, a technical team to deliver the project. It might be that one of the partners or directors has brought the client through to a point where, yes, they want to work with the firm and then hand it over to um, an account manager or an associate. Um, and maybe that handover could be, a, a, could be um, improved so that the associate knows what the expectations are and can pick it up as opposed to um, acting a little bit on the, um, in, the, in the dark. So size i think particularly there around the handover between one person and another and on the client side or, yeah on the client side as well there can be a handover from those that do the initial um vetting of, of, of suppliers of vendors um partners and then those who are involved with the operational side of things and again that team can change and that can change the dynamics of a project which sort of brings it into the second area, which is the people side of things. So people, it's all mostly in the knowledge business, it's, it's all about people and people's expectations and whether they whether their expectations are met. Um, and being aware of what which people are involved in this uh, in a particular relationship. There's there's the obvious ones who are um actively involved in the process but there may be other stakeholders behind the scenes who who are being reported to as it were information is being passed on to them what are their expectations so is there a, a board of directors for example with some expectations uh, are there different uh, different group, groups of people around the organization on the client side 
Um, looking at uh, expectations, I touched on there the, the expectations of various stakeholders, the people who are actively involved, of the decision makers, and then how to manage those expectations. So part of that I would suggest is looking at what's the vision for the project, what's the, the overall outcome that is wanted, what, are the, what does success look like? Are there any measurable uh, success criteria? Um, then look more de in a more detailed way, are there any dependencies? So what, are there any direct or indirect dependencies, particularly around um, the resources that are required for a project through a relationship? Maybe the technology side of things. Uh, maybe there's some data or some content required um, that needs to be factored in. Looking at timescales, are they very ambitious? Uh, and, and what's the approach to slippage or um, realigning expectations on the, the timescale? Are there risks involved in a project and the client relationship? So various aspects there to be talked to, uh, talked around, and so that they, the, the part, both partners, both um, the one delivering the services and the receiving the services understand that. And then looking at the communications plan, what is the approach to the dialogue? Are there structured milestones, whether it's a weekly review, a monthly review? Uh, situations I've been in previously with larger projects, there's been a, a project management level review on a weekly basis, um, and then sponsor reviews on a monthly or quarterly basis, just to make sure that there's a visibility of the timetable and, and in a way update and escalation uh, routes there. Um, the commercial side needs to be considered as well, looking at the um, payment milestones. Uh, when will the invoices be raised and are there any conditions around those invoices? When will payment be made on those invoices? Um, so some, some mechanics and logistics there to consider. Uh, also look at, be mindful of scope. And I think particularly this is worth bearing in mind throughout. What were the expectations of scope set during the, the purchasing phase, the, 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 the selling phase? And is there then reconfirmation of that scope at a, uh, at a kickoff meeting? And are both sides mindful of how that scope might change through the project? So a number of occasions, a number of projects I've been involved with that have been um, examples of how those things need to be managed when, for example, doing um, LinkedIn profile rewrites at the moment, I've developed a process there that sets those expectations. Um, my introduction there is quite uh, uh, honed now, having been doing that hundreds of times. And particularly one of those is looking at the uh, expectations for draft one versus draft two. Draft one is getting the structuring and the messaging right. It's not looking at the spelling and grammar, for example. So just setting an expectation that don't expect the first draft to be completely punctuated and because uh, um, that's where people tend to, their eye goes into the spelling and if that's wrong, they think, ooh, this is, this is um, you know, what's the quality of this going to be like? The little things like that. Um, going back a few years, I was involved with the implementation of uh, uh, mini computers and was involved with running uh, what we call implementation kickoff meetings. That was a structured meeting covering eight or ten areas, preparing a, a small business for um, the receipt of their mini computer, the computer room and things like that. So there was a, a checklist to go through just to make sure that every new client was able to prepare the, the right um, uh, team and facilities and do the training and so on. And then that was an opportunity to get those any questions and uncertainties out of the way and help the client to feel very, uh, very pleased that the project was being guided through by people who were doing this on a regular basis. Um, other areas, for example, training, where there's an expectation with the person commissioning the training and then making sure that the participants in a training course have a similar expectation that by introducing a, a session with them. Um, looking at consultancy, going in there into maybe more of an unknown circumstance so that the, the precise outcomes are not known at the start of a, of a discovery or an investigation stage, but looking at how the process will set up that discovery. Are there any 
no-go areas, for example? Are there any particular areas or particular styles of questioning? So, so how probing can that be? And setting an expectation that that you know pushing the envelope on those questions, it's not it's for the purpose of data gathering and understanding sensitivities. It's not necessarily providing recommendations or trying to influence the outcome through those probing questions. And there's a yeah, an implementation or influence aspect around that. Um, and then looking through to the relationship side of things, a key area here is making sure that people feel happy. You know, are they, the importance of how are people feeling through the process? Are they being comfortable being led through the process? Do they want to be much more an equal player, equal partner on that process? And particularly there, how do people feel if there are issues and uh, uh, aspects and disagreements and so on that, that come through? Is there a the separation, as it were? So there's a twin track there. The relationships continue, even though there are discrepancies and difficulties that need to be overcome. And keeping the, the rapport going so that uh, even if there are some difficult negotiations, then the relationship will, will survive that. Um, and through that, you know, as much of that as can be done to set the project up at the starting point so that those sort of things can be put on the table early on, anticipated, there's a process in place if the following things happen. Again, scale and size of the project matters. There's no point in over-engineering a one-to-one -one relationship. But also I'd suggest there's no point in cutting the corners and just assuming that everything's going to go smoothly if it's a one-to-one. And then look at the outcomes, and particularly here, what is the milestone for the end of that uh, phase, relationship, uh, project, or whatever, so that there is a, a, an end point and there's probably a process around that end that is to review um, and, and hand over to the next stage so that there is a completion date of some sort and some sort of a wrap up around that just to make sure that all the parties are happy. Um, there's probably some documentation that goes around that to make sure that there's evidence that the project's completed successfully and that all the, the loose ends are tied up. If there's any um, uh, training required, any um, you know, commercial side of things that uh, the final payments are made and things like that. Uh, and it may be that there's some support, some support on, on going from there. So just th thinking there about the onboarding process of how to uh, have a checklist of what to cover at the some sort of a kickoff um, session at the start of a project where there's a handover from a, the sales side of things and the buying side or the client side uh, into implementation, a checklist of have we done something appropriate to the size, have we covered all of the uh, aspects that we need to put on the table in at the start of a project to get the success have we got the right people involved in the communication and is the communication process through the project uh, discussed and, and and we're happy with that are the expectations there okay for um, achieving a successful outcome and, and handling any things that arise through the project just so that the relationships between people all, all the all the parties are yeah, comfortable and that whichever way the project goes albeit well it goes successfully but even if it doesn't go successfully if there are ripples along the way then people can feel comfortable that that was a good project that happy to give a, a recommendation do repeat business with and so on so I hope that's been a useful checklist and uh, encourage you to maybe look at uh, three to five projects recently to say you know projects or, or client relationships how could they have been uh, improved is there anything to revisit there? Could we get a testimonial out of a completed project? Um, and is there anything that could be done to, to improve that, to save time, to collapse the time, be able to deliver it quicker? Um, all sorts of things like that that could be done to, uh, to improve the outcomes. So I hope that's been useful. If you want to chat over any of those things, please uh, get in touch with me. It's Mark Stonham for the Rainmaker Briefings. Thank you.